You don't want to be a spectator. You want to get out in the field where the action is. And you will be amazed. After the struggle, there will be a calm period and things will begin to click for you. At a time when people are going to work and don't know whether or not they will have a job when they get off, and not necessarily because of their performance, but because of what's happening in the economy. At a time when there are challenges, more so than ever before, in personal relationships. When we look at what's happening on the crime level, and what's happening with our youth, that many times I'm sure that we've all taken time just to stop and reflect many times when we hear what's happening in the news or read the newspapers. Where's all of this leading to? What's going on here? And so I think that now more than ever, we must begin to look at what are the things that we can do that would put us on some firm footing in life, that will enable us to do some things and, and use some powers that we have that many of us go through life never ever discovering that we have those things going for us. And part of that, I believe, is knowing what it is your life worth. What is it that gives your life a sense of meaning and purpose? Because once you find that, it puts you in your power place. See, if you know what your life work is, I encourage you to start working on it. If you can't do it all at one time, do just a little bit of it. And if you don't know what it is that you showed up to do, if you don't know why you're here, I encourage you to find out what your purpose is here. What is the meaning of your life? What will be different? Have you ever asked yourself that question? I've done that. I, I remember coming from a friend of mine's funeral and I was reflecting on how much time I had left. And I went for a walk in a park thinking about this guy whose life was so promising. And I mean, he wasn't an old guy. He was quite young, in fact. And I thought about all of the things that he said he was going to do, and he never got a chance to do those things. And I start thinking about my own life and how much time I had left to do the things that I would like to do. And at that time, I wasn't sure what my life purpose was, what my life's work was. I wasn't sure about it at that time. And I thought about it quite a lot. I had some idea, but I, I wasn't convinced that I don't think I felt worthy. I didn't believe that it could be me to do this kind of work that I'm doing right now. And I say to you that if you begin to take a conscious effort to find out what it is that you're supposed to do, I say that it can literally save your life. I said that it can literally save your life. I was telling a group of people of a study that was conducted. Dr. Larry Darcy, who wrote a book called Recovering the Soul, he said, human beings are the only living species that has achieved the dubious distinction of dying or having a stroke or a heart attack on a certain day. If you ask most people, what would you say the primary cause of why people would have a heart attack or stroke. Many people will say, well, because they smoke cigarettes or because of high cholesterol or because of stress or because of obesity. And all of those things are contributing factors. But ladies and gentlemen, more heart attacks take place in this country on Monday morning between 8 and 9 a.m. That's when the majority of people who have their first heart attacks have them. 85% of the American public, according to recent studies, are going to jobs that they hate. Working on jobs that do not challenge them. They get sick thinking about going. Migraine headaches. After the Sunday afternoon football game, or 60 minutes, the anxiety began to build. And come Monday morning, they drop dead of a broken heart. Because see, when you go to a job and, and you already know how far you can go, you can already see that proverbial glass ceiling. It's like going to a movie when you've gone in in the middle of the movie. 
and you've seen the end and, and you sit there to, for it to start all over again, but something is missing. You know what the outcome is going to be. You can't get excited about going through that movie all over again. Am I correct? See, when you're going someplace and you already know how much you're going to make, you already know how far you can go. You're in a dead end position. It erodes your self-esteem. It lowers your sense of yourself. It creates an inner turmoil. It creates an emptiness in you. So I say that your life is worth finding what it is that you're supposed to do. And I'm not saying quit your job. I'm saying find it and do just a little bit of it. When I wanted to become involved in speaking, I started just learning quotes, listening to other people's tapes, going to seminars, going to workshops, asking other people to help me. Just start working at it just a little bit, but do find out what your work is and hold on to it and don't let your dream go. Don't let it go. See, and here's a, something else I want you to begin to look at. Why is it that most people don't pursue their dreams or don't do better than what they're doing if they're capable of doing it? I think that many of us don't go the next step because we don't know what to do yet. <laughs> and I say that that the reason that we don't even explore the possibility of what to do is because subconsciously we don't believe that it can happen for us and we don't believe that we deserve it. So here's what I'm suggesting. How much time do you spend working on you? How much time do you spend every day working on your dream? In the last 90 days, how many books have you read? In the last year, what new skill or knowledge have you acquired? What kind of investment have you made in you? So I'm saying that as you begin to look at where you want to go, if you want to make it today, and things are changing so fast, you have to literally run to stand still. I'm saying that you've got to make some conscious effort to begin to work to develop you. Here's something else. Most people are not living their dreams because of fear, ladies and gentlemen. I was in Columbus, Ohio yesterday speaking for a particular Ohio department. Young lady named Karen who greeted me, who organized the event. Very talented, very skillful. And she was talking about she wanted to become involved in the consulting business. I said, why aren't you doing it? I said, you have the abilities. I said, you're not here because they like you. You're here because you're doing the job. You're making things happen. And she came up with all kinds of ideas, but finally she said, I guess I, I can't see myself doing it. I guess I'm afraid. Fear, limited vision, and lack of self-esteem is what keep most people doing things they don't want to do. I was, flew from Columbus, Ohio to Denver, Colorado to a major communications company. And the person that picked me up at the airport told me about the fact that the company was planning on having a major downsizing. And they offered some of the employees there an early retirement and some of them will earn as much as $300,000. And they said, this is the last time that you can take this offer. If you don't do it, when we have the downsizing, you might be among those who will lose their jobs and all you will get is your severance pay. And only 50% of the people who were eligible to take the $300,000 took it. The others were afraid to take a chance on themselves. The others couldn't see themselves beyond that company. They couldn't see life after that company. The same reason that people stay in relationships where they're abused or they're unhappy or it's unfulfilling. They can't see themselves beyond that relationship. They can't see themselves enjoying life without that person. They think that this is all that they can do. The same reason that people get stuck at a certain level in life. They can't see things being better for them. And they think that this is it and this is all they deserve. This is all they've ever seen. It's been passed on to them. And they think that this is it for them. Oh, no. I'm looking what Dr. Blanton, Smiley Blanton, who is a colleague of Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, what he said about fear. He said, fear is the most subtle and destructive of all human diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, fear kills dreams. Fear kills hope. Fear, put people in the hospital. 
Fear can age you. Fear, ladies and gentlemen, can hold you back from doing something that you know within yourself that you are capable of doing, but it will paralyze you. And it seemed like you're in a hypnotic spell. And I ask you a question, what is the benefit? What's the benefit of allowing fear to hold you back? What's the benefit of giving up on yourself? Of not stepping out on life and taking life on. What is the benefit for you? What's the plus in that? It's one of the things I had to ask myself. So I didn't want to make any mistakes. I wanted everybody to like me. I wanted to be perfect the first time I did something. It's not going to happen. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to hurt some folks' feelings. You're going to create some enemies. Whenever you decide that you want to begin to take life on. You've got to ask yourself. How long am I going to allow this to hold me back? I like what Zig Ziglar says. He said, fear is false evidence appearing real. That is an illusion that we create in our mind. It is a state of mind that can be changed. So let's look at how we can begin to take some steps to restructure that fear. To begin to expand our visions of ourselves. To begin to increase our self-esteem. Webster said that self-esteem means confidence and satisfaction in oneself. Look at your life right now. Whatever you've done up to this point in time, your life is working. Whatever you have produced, it came out of you as a result of the kind of person that you have become. It's a result of your choices. It's a result of your consciousness. Now you have to ask yourself, are you satisfied with what you have produced? Is this what you want? Would you like for things to be better than this? Do you believe that you deserve better than this? Or are you content? This is it. You don't have to do every, anything else. That you already resign yourself in life and say, well, I'm happy. I'm not starving like the people in Calcutta. Are you allowing yourself to get off the hook like that? Or do you believe somewhere in the back of your mind or in your heart that there is some other great work for you to do? There's something else that life has for you. And that's why you're here. How do we handle this fear factor? How do we increase our self-esteem? You have to begin to fortify yourself. How do we do that? I believe that you have to begin to consciously monitor your inner conversation and start talking to yourself. Start building yourself up. Sometimes the only good things you will hear about you are the things that you say to you. young lady that, that was in the audience this afternoon said to me, I told myself yesterday for the first time, I'm proud of me. And she said, I felt good about that. So I'm saying learn to be your own booster. Start building yourself up. Start encouraging yourself. Start saying, I can do this. I can make this happen. When I started thinking about becoming a speaker, I said, yes, I can do this. I can make this happen. When I start trying to convince myself I can be a businessman after flopping and failing and losing thousands of dollars and feeling stupid and dumb and having people take advantage of me because of what I didn't know. I had to talk to myself because people were saying to me that I was dumb. And somewhere in the back of my mind I was saying, you're right, look at what I've done. I had to say, no, 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 Les. Hey, hey, come on, man, get yourself together. You can handle this. You just haven't figured it out yet. It's all right. This is your training period. This is the tuition you have to pay for what you don't know. You can do this. Other people have done it. It doesn't take an Einstein. Get you some people that can teach you some stuff that you don't know. Get you some people that have done it successfully and learn from them. Take some seminars, workshops, read some books on how to manage a business. Change the way you see yourself and begin to tend to the personal details. Understand that nobody's going to take care of your business better than you. And when I start changing that kind of mindset of beating myself up because of my mistakes and start looking at the possibility of my doing better, of my making the adjustment that would enable me to do what I want to do successfully, things begin to change. And I say, stop beating up on yourself. You do do it. I know you do it. I've done it. It's a natural inclination for us to put ourselves down. See, we are born negative, I think in a negative consciousness because we live in a negative world. So you don't have to teach children to lie. They'll lie automatically. You don't have to encourage kids to misbehave. They will do it by themselves. 
You don't have to encourage them to do the wrong thing. They would do it automatically. You have to correct their behavior. So I'm saying that we have to work through the challenges of life in learning how to begin to work to fortify ourselves. Begin to guard your mind against negative programming, like turn off the television. Don't watch the news. More people have a sense of hopelessness and anxiety about life. If you look at the news, you cannot feel good looking at the news. You'll be scared to death. You're scared to go to sleep. I mean, it turns your power down. You've got to be conscious of that. Don't pick up the newspaper and read it. No, no. I, just try this. Just experiment with yourself. Now, if your job depends upon you knowing certain things, let somebody tell you just about those things. But stop filtering the stuff you allow to come in your mind. You know that song you used to have? I said, don't let nobody bring you no bad news. I tell my staff, look here, don't tell me any bad news while I'm on the road. Let me handle it tomorrow. I don't like anybody to tell me any bad news at night before I go to sleep. I can't do anything about it anyhow. Why? Let me go to sleep with that on my consciousness. No. No, and my, my staff, they know that. They say, let it wait till tomorrow. And I have a period of time. Tell me bad news between 10 o'clock and 12 noon. <laughs> After I prayed and meditated and read my books, I'm fortified. I'm ready to handle it. I deal with them that I'm out of there and I'm going on to something else. So you've got to guard the kinds of things that you put in your mind. See, if you don't program your mind, your mind will be programmed because human beings are goal-oriented. That's why we die of broken hearts early. That's why we're running through life to early graves. We're going through life, ladies and gentlemen. And I think that Henry David Thoreau said that most men live in quiet desperation. Most of us go through life running scared. Larry D'Angie, who I think is going to be one of the greatest motivational speakers around today, told me a story, a true story of a friend of his that every day when he came home from school, when he would get to uh, a certain block in his neighborhood, there was a neighborhood dog that would chase him. And that dog would start after him barking, boy, he would run, just running from that dog every day, every day. Finally, he just got tired of that dog chasing him every day. He said, this dog come around here today, I'm going to take a brick or something and bust him in the head. <laughs> so he was walking home that day, minding his own business. Sure enough, same area, there was that dog there. And the dog started barking, he started running, he saw a brick and he stopped and picked up the brick and turned around and the dog got close to him, he realized the dog didn't have any teeth. <laughs> he said he put the brick down, he said, get on out of my way. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, all our lives, many of us go through life running from things that ain't got no teeth to do us any harm. you've been afraid to do something and then after you did it you say whoa if i known it was this easy i would have done it before haven't you ever had that experience raise your hand absolutely so we created this in our minds false evidence appearing real we made it real in our minds that's why churchill said there's nothing to fear but fear itself that's the destructive monster so Turn off things that can contribute to your fear. Turn a deaf ear to people that all they can do is talk about how negative things are because they have bought into the consciousness of the world. Start attending workshops, seminars, listening to tapes on a daily basis to begin to recondition your mind, to retrain your thinking. Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing and hearing. Listen to things that can empower you, that can enable you to create a new reality for yourself in a new life for yourself. You might appear to be strange around most people. You know, most people think you're strange if you're happy today. People say, how you doing? I said, better than good. Whoa, what's wrong with him? Just go around smiling and watch people. Look at this, is this a weird guy over here? Because most people don't smile. Watch him, look at their faces in the morning. Here we go, another Monday morning. How you doing? Haven't had my coffee yet, don't ask me. See, these people have not found their purpose in life. That's why they're grumpy. That's why they're miserable. That's why they're so negative. They're hurting and they want to hurt other people. So start practicing using programs for your mind. Seminars, books, workshops. Keep a journal. Record your thoughts. What's happening with you? 
Every day when you get up, have a journal near you. I use a Jack Bolin journal so that I can write down my ideas. I keep it by my bed so I can write down my thoughts. See, ladies and gentlemen, we get three to four thoughts a year that if we would act on those thoughts, they could change our life. Don't say, well, I'll, I'll remember that. No, write that thought down. I got a thought today I wrote down. A friend of mine is in the hospital. His morale is low. They're talking about amputating his foot. He's got to feel very bad. So I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm not only am I going to see him, but I can't be there with him all the time. I said, I'm going to create a tape for him that, that he can listen to that will heighten his level of morale. We told him the other night, don't go to surgery. You are depressed. Your energy level is down. No, no, tell him not now. Don't do it now. In fact, most doctors who have any sense of awareness don't perform surgery on patients that are in a state of fear. They don't think they will make it. They wait till they're in a different state of mind. So I said, what about making tapes for people that are facing physical challenges? I said, that's a good idea. All right. See, there are ideas that can come to you out of things that appear to be negative. I have a friend out of Chicago, just met him. He was 23 years old. And this guy, he went financially bankrupt two years ago, ruined his credit. Guess what he decided to do? He found a blessing in it. He wanted to restore his credit. It was very challenging, very difficult. And he realized that a lot of other people during these particular times have ruined their credit. So now he started a credit repair business. Last year, he earned over $100,000 helping people to restore their credit. I met a young lady who attends this church that she was at her father's funeral and, and she was putting flowers on her father's grave and she looked around and saw the other grave sites. They did not look well-groomed and they were not attended to on a regular basis. She started a grave site maintenance business. Out of that tragedy, something positive has come out of it. And now she's earning more money doing that than on her present job. What idea are you sitting on? Write your ideas down. And then, once you get that idea, take the leap. Hello? <laughs> take the leap. See, a lot of people get the ideas and just walk around with them. Have you ever had an idea and all of a sudden you looked around and somebody had that idea and gone with it? <laughs> think you're going to be going with my hospital idea. Forget that, buddy. <laughs> we will be out there together, Jack. <laughs> take the leap. See, it's out here in the universe. If you don't take the plunge, I guarantee you, somebody else will. Take the plunge. Go into action. And ladies and gentlemen, you will be surprised at how things will come together. You'll be surprised. Now, you're going to have some difficult challenges. I can tell you that now. Be aware of that. Things are not going to work out exactly right. For a time they will, sometimes. And that's when life is just playing a game with you. I want you to feel good and relax. And then after a while, say, okay, the honeymoon's over now. And then life will come over there and slap you side to here. Say, what you doing out here? Well, this is my dream life. Is that right? Come over here a minute. <laughs> oh, you went to the seminar, huh? Come here. <laughs> I can tell you that. But ladies and gentlemen, go into action with your dream. And don't avoid where the fights are. Get in the midst of the fight. And get some hickeys on your head. <laughs> get knocked down so you can learn how to fight, so you can hold your position. See, most people don't get out in the arena of life because they don't want to fight. Most people don't get out there because they don't want to get knocked down. They don't want to be dropped to their knees. But see, you're going to be dropped whether you're on the field or whether or not you're sitting on the sidelines. You're going to be dropped. So at least get dropped for something. Don't get knocked down while you're sitting down. <laughs> see, that's how most people are spectators in life. You don't want to be a spectator. You want to get out in the field where the action is. And you will be amazed. After the struggle, there will be a calm period and things will begin to click for you. Come out here with what you got. You don't have enough money? Don't worry about it. You got the dream. You got the idea. You don't have enough resources? Don't worry about it. You need some help? Don't worry about it. You get out here in the arena, someone will look at you and become inspired and say, hey, can I help you?
But if you're sitting up on the bleachers, nobody's going to ask you anything. At some time or another, have agonized over making a decision. Some decisions are major decisions. And also there are a lot of small decisions that we don't make. That they tax our minds, they drain our energy. They create a lot of anxiety and nervousness and mental torment because we don't take care of it. We decide not to decide, which is a decision. Deciding to decide, to act, is a major, major challenge for all of us at different points in different areas of our lives. And there are things that happen to us along the way experiences that we have that prevent us from working through the mental block of acting of doing those things that we know we ought to do and so what i want you to think about is what is there that you know you need to do that you want to do this but for some reason or another you've been holding back for some reason or another, you just have not been able to gather your nerves or be able to work through the procrastinating or putting it off or justifying or blaming. Some reason or another, you just haven't done it. And you know you ought to do this. You really want to do this, but you don't know why you haven't done it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand, please. Okay, then I've got company here this evening. I'm not talking to myself. Now, first of all, we know that this is not easy. Because in order to begin to reinvent your life, you've got to make a conscious, deliberate, determined effort. That you really have got to put all of yourself into it. It's very challenging to act, to do those things. There are times when you're looking at it and you say, I, I know I need to do this, but I don't feel like it. I don't want to do it. I know I need to do it, yet leave me alone. No. I don't want to do it. So what do we do? What are those things that, that cause us to do like that? I think that among the things that prevent us from acting is the fear of failure. And if you've already failed, you don't want to fail again. The pain of that, the disappointment, the fear of loss is another thing. Because many times when we do those things that we know we need to do, we feel that we might lose somebody that we love very much and care about. We don't want to hurt anybody. Many of us don't act because we want other people's approval. We want everybody to like us and to accept us. And that's not possible. Many of us don't do the things that we want to do and don't act because of lack of self-confidence. We don't believe enough in ourselves. I have a friend who's been working on a job where she's miserable, talented, want to go to another place that she can do what she wants to do and make the kind of money that she would like to make and have had some offers. But because of her fear and her lack of self-confidence of things might not work out, she won't take a chance on herself. So there she is spending eight hours a day, five days a week, and she's miserable. She hates to go to work. They're not paying her what she's worth. She knows it. But yet and still, she won't do that which she knows she must do, and it's wearing her out. There are a lot of people that their jobs are making them sick because they won't act. You check out the absenteeism and the people that are depressed. You see them coming to work angry. How are you doing? I don't know. <laughs> Just leave me alone. It's not even 9 o'clock yet. You're talking about good morning. There are days you go to work, you want to just keep driving past the job. You, know? you don't want to stop because it's not in sync with who you are. But you haven't acted. Have another friend. This guy's brilliant. He's a business consultant. He helped a lot of people get their business started. And people come to him because they know he's knowledgeable. But this guy won't start his own business. Now, he's very smart. He can do it. Everybody believes in him except him. And he's so smart, he's talked himself out of it. Well, the numbers aren't right. 
So there are many reasons why we don't act. There are other things though that affect us. It's that not wanting to take personal responsibility. We want somebody else to do it. And we, many times we pick up our inability to do certain things from people that we love, people that we admire. We identify with them and we live in the context of their ideas, their opinions, and their life patterns. We buy into it unconsciously. My mother is a pack rat. She keeps everything. She doesn't throw anything away. And I have unconsciously picked that up. Now, my mother never said, let me show you how to keep everything less and just clutter things. I unconsciously pick that up. Many times, unconsciously, we try to honor the people we love by being like them. By the same token, I realized something about myself when I had some major decisions to make, and I found myself acting like my mother. See, my mother's the kind of person that when she has a problem with one of the other foster children that she adopted, she won't confront them. She will call me. Les, why don't you tell Linda to move? <laughs> She's lazy. She won't go to work. She runs the street all day and then she comes home and wants to sleep all day. And I think she's doing drugs. I said, but mama, why don't you tell Linda that? I bought the house for you. I told you when she wanted to come home, don't let a grown person come there and take care of them. You let her in. Well, after all, she's my child. Mama, then you handle that. When I tell her to leave, she say, Mama say, I can stay. Mama, can I stay? And you tell her yes. And then you call me and say, she's still here. <laughs> Why worry me with this? So Mama hasn't developed the courage to act on that. Some people won't act until there's a crisis situation. When Linda started stealing from Mama and took her social security check, to get some drugs. Mama got some courage to say, get out of here. <laughs> and don't ever come back. But she wouldn't do it until then. And see, we don't have to wait until a crisis situation. I have a friend that has been having a challenge with losing weight. Both of us have been dealing with that challenge. And for the past 40 years, he's always seemed like weighed over 235 pounds. And so he said, man, I just can't lose weight. I'm big boned it. I say, bud, I've never seen any fat skeletons. <laughs> no, you need to act on your health. You can change this. Well, you don't have to go to your grave fat. We're all digging early graves with our teeth. We don't have to do this. They need to have a support group around M&M peanuts. You want a support group on something? and throw Snickers in there too. <laughs> Bud and I can tell you about the help we need with that. So what happened with Bud though, he became ill a few weeks ago. See, Bud in the last few weeks has lost more weight than he's ever lost, even when we were competing with each other, betting a lot of money. But what happened was, Bud became diabetic. He went into an insulin shock. He didn't know that he was diabetic. His blood sugar became high. And the doctor said to him, you are diabetic. You're going to have to have insulin shots every day. You're going to have to change your diet. And let me tell you what's going to happen if you don't do what we tell you to do. Number one, there's a possibility that you can become an amputee. Number two, you can go blind. Three, you can become impotent. But say, help me. <laughs> <laughs> like those guys when, when Paul when, when Paul broke out of jail those guys say tell me what I must do to be saved <laughs> Bud were to be saved I said Bud you want to want my peanut butter and jelly sandwiches no I said Bud I can't believe you're eating vegetables man you're exercising he said that's right a jogging in place too <laughs> Now, he had the ability to do it before, but there's some people, it takes that kind of crisis to bring them into reality in order for them to act in their own best interest. Some people have to hit rock bottom in order to rise. I don't know why. You want to begin to look out on your life. 
and what you want for you. And I think that when we begin to focus in the area of what does it take for us to act, I think we can say events can inspire us to act, like that particular event in his life. Circumstances, a friend of mine, he wanted to do something and, and he just did not have the motivation and the drive and the confidence within himself. But his circumstances change overnight through an acquisition of the company that he worked for. He lost his job through the inspiration of desperation. He had to act. See, life also are things that can inspire us to act. See, we don't have the courage, and that's what it takes, courage. It takes guts to do that which you know you need to do. If you don't have the courage to act, life many times will move on you and make you act. Life will whoop your butt so bad you will be so miserable, you will catch so much hell, you say, yes, I will do it. What do you want me to do? Take me. A friend of mine said, I can't stop smoking. I can't stop smoking. Doctor said, Sam Axelrod, you have emphysema. Sam never picked up another cigarette. He said, look at those stupid people smoking. Sam, you did it for 35 years. How can you talk about people? Well, I was different. I'm, I'm trying to help them. <laughs> they don't have to do the same thing I did. But be compassionate, Sam. Isn't it interesting how quickly we forget? So I'm saying that look at something in your life. It might be just writing a letter to somebody to say thank you. It might be just to apologize to somebody. I had a confrontation in the Penobscot building with a security guard there. He responded to me what I perceived as a negative way, and he and I engaged in an argument. I did not like the way I handled that. I avoided going through the front door for a long time because I didn't want to face him. Finally, I decided to act, and I went up to him and said, I want to apologize to you for the way in which I handled this argument we had the other day. I was wrong. I hope you accept my apology. He said, I do. And I said, thank you very much. I felt relieved. Now, when you decide to act, it's not always going to be like that. A friend of mine did some work for me. It was below par, to say the least. I knew that this guy was capable of doing better work. I knew that he also had a fragile ego. So I was trying to think of what is the most sensitive way in which I can share this information with him. Because I wanted him to do my work over. I was going to pay him for what he did. But I needed my work done right. But I was afraid that I would hurt his feelings. I was very, very meticulous in how I approached him. And I said, let me share this with you. You know I care about you and that you're a very talented and gifted person. And you and I both know that what you have given me is not a true reflection of your talents and abilities. And I'm saying, let's go back in the studio and do this again. And he said to me, I'm going to forget you ever said that. I was wiped out. He never spoke to me again. Now, when you decide to act, you're going to have some people like that. We're no longer friends. I lost sleep over that, ladies and gentlemen. I said, I can't believe that. I, I remember st sitting up one night looking at the phone. I said, I got to call him. He said, no. Then I said, no, forget that. I called, man, look here. We've been knowing each other too long to allow this to come between us. He said, don't call me anymore, and hung up. And then I, I wanted to think about how, what can I do to make it up to him, and then something came to me, less. what do you have to prove? See, many things we don't do is because of the fact we want people to like us. There's some necessary losses in life. When you decide acting in your best interest, you're gonna lose some friends. Everybody's not going to approve of you. There's some people that won't like you. Who do you think you are? You're arrogant. What do you think you can do? You think you can get away with that? You're selfish. Thanks, I got that. <laughs> it's my life. And so what I'm saying to you is that as you begin to look out on your life, this is challenging. This is not easy acting. So what are the things that we can begin to do to harness our will. Number one, 
You've got to bring it out and look at it. You've got to take the power out of it. You've got to expose it to the truth. And the truth is that it has no power over you. So write down something you want to act on, but for some reason that you've been holding back and look at it. The next thing is, ask yourself the question, is it helping you to continue to put it off? If it's an asset for you to continue to, to procrastinate, then continue to do that. But if it's a liability for you, if it's causing you some mental and some emotional challenges or perhaps a financial problem, look at that. <coughs> Examine that for what it is. Next step, ask yourself, what's blocking you? What's preventing you from acting? Why don't you have the courage to handle that? Why won't you face that? What are you running away from? What kind of avoidance behavior are you engaged in? Next is, what is the worst thing that can happen when you take action? So I looked at that and I said, what's the worst thing can happen when I tell him this? He can say, I don't like you. And he did. <laughs> now what happened? I experienced that. I looked at that. I saw that. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? I didn't die. My feelings were hurt a little bit. I lost some sleep about it. And sometimes I think about it when I drive past his house. But I'm still here. It's uncomfortable. But it's okay. It doesn't bother me anymore. I've gotten used to it now. So what is the worst thing that can happen? I want you to visualize that, experience that, feel the nervousness and the discomfort. And the more you run it in your mind, the less power that it will have. Next is, how will you feel after taking this action? I felt a sense of personal achievement when I face somebody that has been my mentor for years. And for years, there was something I wanted to tell him. And I didn't have the courage to tell him because it was always I was the student, he was the teacher. It was always I looked up to him and admired him and held him in high esteem. And I was always grateful and thankful for the impact that he had on my life. And I loved him so much. I didn't have the courage to say to him, please stop drinking so much. You're an alcoholic. You need help. I didn't have the courage because I was afraid that he might not like me. I was afraid that he might be hurt and crushed that we would no longer be friends. I didn't want to jeopardize what we had. I loved him a great deal and I didn't, I didn't know how this would affect our relationship. And I didn't even want him to know that I knew that he was an alcoholic. And so I was a coward, I was spineless. In the name of love, I did it to justify to myself to, to stop from helping somebody that I loved from dying. I said, I love him so much, I just can't tell him this. I, I, I don't even know how he would handle it to know that I know that he's an alcoholic. And finally, after years, I developed the courage to face my teacher, my mentor who has molded me, who looks at me now and wanted to do what I'm doing now and did not do it, came at a different time and it wasn't time for what he brought and he's living through me and I had to face this man who's been like a father to me and say, I got to tell you something you've got a problem I love you very much please stop drinking you're killing yourself it's not just social you do it every day you need help and whatever I can do to support you in that I will please stop and he looked at me and I had no idea what, how he was going to handle that. And first there was like, I dare you. And we just looked at each other. And then I reached out to embrace him. And we've never ever embraced men, macho, never hugged before. I hugged him and he just stood there with his arms straight. He couldn't raise his arms to hug me back. And he was shocked. And after he got over the initial shock, when he could bring himself to speak, to maintain his composure, because he could never afford to let me, his student, see him vulnerable or admit that I was right. 
He said, I'll be seeing you. And I said, yes, sir. I said, tell your wife I'll be by the house to see, the, see y'all before I leave. And when he walked away, at first I was very depressed about it. And I said, well, maybe it wasn't my place to do this. And you know, when you act, you're going to have some second thoughts. And then I said, no, no, no. I did what I felt. I did it because I feel very strongly about this. And fortunately, he called me back a few weeks later and left word with the answering service. Leslie Brown, I just want to say thank you. And hung up. That was a good feeling. When we look out on our lives, you ask the question, what are you going to do? Look at, as you think about this that you know you need to handle, what are you going to do? And then write down three strong reasons on why you know you must take action. And be explicit and descriptive in your reasons because your reasons have power. Your reasons will drive you. When you have doubt, when your faith becomes weak, your reasons will fortify your faith. When you have an inner conversation, say, no, don't do that. Your reasons will become your rod and your staff to comfort you, to take you through those challenging moments. So write down your reasons. And what you will find, that when you decide to act, when you decide to take life on, and let me warn you, it can be painful, it will be uncomfortable, and that's where the growth is. When you're uncomfortable, when you're stretching out, when you're taking life by the collar, you're going to get thrown to the ground again and again and again. But when you have determination and you know that what you're doing is right, it gives you your life, it gives a special meaning and power to you, you will have some power from on high. You will discover some things about yourself that will begin to electrify your personality. You begin to discover some things about you that you don't know you've got when you put yourself in that type of challenging situation.